continue our muscle discussion by looking at muscle twitches. Muscle twitches occur when there's a stimulus that causes one or more muscle cells to contract within a muscle, but not the entire muscle itself. So here you don't have all of a muscle contracting, just some of the individual fibers. Sometimes you feel these twitches in your eyelids or something such as that. There's also different phases to muscle contraction. First is the lag, also called the latent phase. This is the time from stimulus being applied to contraction. With something like a skeletal muscle cell, that's thousands of a second. Contraction is the time in which the actin is sliding over the myosin. Remember, the myosin myofilaments actually slide the actin over the surface of them, bringing them closer together. Then you're going to have relaxation, where the muscle's returning back to its resting length. In other words, stretching back out to where it started. Looking at muscle strength and contraction and how it works, one thing that applies to it is the all or none principle. You'll also see this being applied to action potentials. All or, none, all or none means you either get one or you don't. There's no little or a lot, no in between. It's all or nothing. So when you look at where muscles contract or where action potentials are generated, there aren't weak ones or strong ones when it comes to an individual muscle cell. You'll see that's different with an entire muscle. But if you look at one individual muscle cell, it's all or nothing. When it's told to contract, it'll do so with as much force as it possibly can every single time. Again, there's no little or a lot, it's all or nothing. Now, something that goes along with this is the subthreshold stimulus. If not enough stimulus is applied, not enough on is moved into the muscle cell to depolarize the cell, no action potential occurs, no muscle contraction occurs. But once you reach threshold stimulus, where you've moved enough on into that muscle cell to swap those charges, again, that's depolarization. When you generate an action potential, and contraction is going to occur. Nothing's going to stop it. And it doesn't matter how strong that stimulus is once it's reached threshold. It doesn't matter if it's a weak one once it's hit threshold or a strong one, but as long as it does, you're going to get contraction, and it's always going to be of the same strength and intensity. Now look here also at a motor unit. A motor unit includes basically two things. The motor neuron that's controlling its bundle of muscle cells. So you take that neuron plus the cells it has control over, and there you got a motor unit. So looking at contraction of the whole muscle, this is different from how the muscle cell works. Remember, we just said the muscle cell works all or none. When it's told to contract, it does so just as strong and forcefully as it can every single time. There's no weak, stronger in between. Again, all or nothing. But that's not how it applies to a muscle. An entire muscle has many muscle cells and many motor units in it. So with an entire muscle, you can get what's called a graded response. Sort of think of that as the opposite of the all or none. Where all or none means you always get a contraction of the same strength and intensity, which again is what happens in a muscle cell. You don't see that with an entire muscle. An entire muscle is made up of many motor units and many motor, many muscle cells. So you can tell some of those motor units to contract where others aren't. And that can give you a weak or strong contraction in the muscle itself. If you pick up something that's very light, you're only using a few of those motor units. You pick up something that's heavy, <clears throat> you're probably using all of them. So again, a whole muscle does work by a graded response. Sort of that, again, as being the opposite of that all or nothing. And multiple motor unit summation tells you that the strength of contraction depends on how many motor units you used. Use a few of them, you'll get a weak contraction. Like when you pick up something that's light, you use a whole bunch of them, you can pick up something that's heavy. That's your graded response there. Also look at stimulus frequency <clears throat> and muscle contraction. As the frequency of action potentials increases, the frequency of contraction increases. Now that can increase to the point of what's called tetany. Tetany is basically muscle contraction without relaxation. So look at what we have with tetany. There's incomplete where the muscle fibers partially relax in between contractions. And then there's complete tetany, where there's no relaxation in between them. So you don't see this so much with muscles right there, but there are times in which you can. 
Multiple wave summation is when muscle tension increases as contraction frequency increases. Now look at an example of where somebody might see some tetany. You may have heard before these organophosphate poisonings. And what they do is bind to the acetylcholine esterase in the synapse between the motor neuron at the end of the axon and then the cell membrane of the skeletal muscle cell. Basically what it does, it keeps the acetylcholine esterase from working. Now remember that acetylcholine esterase is what removes the acetylcholine from the skeletal muscle cell. If this enzyme, ASE, acetylcholine esterase, is not there, the acetylcholine will never be removed. The muscle will have constant contraction. That's one thing that could cause complete tetany. And if something like that happens with, say, something like the diaphragm muscle, you stop moving air in and out of the lungs. And, of course, that can lead to death. Trepa. Now, trepa is another little thing we'll look at. It does work by a graded response like an entire muscle does. And it occurs in a muscle that's rested for a prolonged period, say after somebody's been sleeping for several hours throughout the night. When you had a muscle rested for a long period of time, it's had lots of time to take all that calcium back up into the storage sites. We looked at that sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is a big storage site for calcium inside of muscle cells in a previous video. But what happens with TREPA is that each subsequent contraction gets stronger than the one before it. It's thought that if a muscle cell sits for a long period of time, there's not really much of any calcium around those actin and myosin filaments. And remember, calcium must be there along with ATP if you want a muscle to contract. So think about this. If a muscle's been resting for a long period of time, there's not much of any calcium around those two myofilaments. And the first time you tell that muscle to contract, you do get a release of calcium, but not a large amount of it. So there's somewhat of a weak contraction. But as you keep telling that muscle to contract over and over, you get more and more calcium release and a stronger contraction. One reason that's a good idea to warm up and when you're using skeletal muscles, if you're about to lift something very heavy like a weightlifter might do. Let's also mention length versus tension. The positioning of those actin and myosin myofilaments is important to how much tension, how much pull you get when you tell that muscle to contract. So let's look here first at something called active tension, the force applied to an object to be lifted when a muscle contracts. Now think about the positioning of a muscle. Let's say you've got a muscle, say something like the biceps brachii, up here in the brachial region along the humerus in your upper limb. Let's say you put your hand out far out away from your body, really stretch that muscle out. Or if you pull your hand all the way up close to your shoulder, You've pulled all those little filaments across each other pretty much as far as you can. Well, if you stretch that muscle out, not all of those actin and myosin myofilaments are overlapped at that time. So if you tell the muscle to contract there, you don't have all the cross bridges that you could possibly. So you're not going to have a really strong muscle contraction at that time. But then also if you bring your hand up close to your shoulder, now you've got all those cross bridges formed. Some of those actin filaments have slid as close to each other as they can. So if you tell the muscle to contract from there, you don't get a lot of force either. Point being, if you've got a muscle stretched all the way out as far as it can go, or contracted as far as it can go, you get less active tension at that time. Somewhere in the middle is where your muscle cells are all going to be working at their best, and you're going to get more pull, more strength out of that muscle. That's why if you watch people weightlifting very heavy weights, they'll usually fail at the very beginning of the exercise or the very end. At the very beginning, those filaments tend to be stretched out where they're not all overlapping. And at the end, some of the actin have already come together and there's no more pull there to be applied. That's why they usually fail at those two points there. Passive tension is the tension applied to a muscle when stretched but not being stimulated. If you take the active and passive and add them together, that'll give you total tension in a muscle. But let's also look a little right here at fatigue. This is the decreased capacity to do work and the reduced efficiency of performance. So you think about if you keep using muscles for a long enough period of time, they don't work as well as what they did before. But look at these three different types of fatigue. The first one here is psychological. The individual 
thinks that more work is not possible, but it is. Sort of like if a person, say, has been running for a long period of time, and they feel like they're just about to fall down and collapse, but people get to cheering them on, and they start to run faster. That's psychological. The individual perceives that more work isn't possible, but it is still there. Now, muscular and synaptic fatigue are very real. Nothing about the mind with these right here. Muscular fatigue occurs when those muscle cells have used up their ATP. You don't have ATP to cause a flexing at the hinge region of that myosin filament. You're not going to get any muscle contraction. There's also synaptic fatigue where you've used up all the acetylcholine in that synapse. There's no more acetylcholine to open up those uh, sodium channels on those skeletal muscle cells. You're not going to get any more depolarizations. The muscle's not going to work there. And right after that, let's look at this physiologic contracture and rigor mortis. With physiologic contracture, this is a state of fatigue where due to a lack of ATP, you can't get contraction or relaxation. Now remember, you got to have ATP for both of these things. If you want that myosin, myofilament, to flex at that hinge region, which pulls the actin closer together, you got to have ATP. It's got to be there to be broken down for the release of energy to get that muscle contraction. But if you want that muscle to relax, in other words, stretch that actin back apart from each other, ATP has to replace the used up ATP, which is now ADP. So you got to have another ATP coming back in for relaxation to occur. And then rigor mortis is something you see occurring several hours after death. They think this is caused by the calcium leaking into the sarcoplasm and attaching to the mice and heads. And at this point, you've got cross bridges which have formed and cannot release. So that's why the muscles are very rigid and stiff at that time. But given enough time, they're going to break down and deteriorate and all of that, of course, will break loose.